Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight. I'm Lois Rogers Watson, and I want, along with many of the sponsoring organizations, I want to say welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, to give a little background on how we got here, uh, it happened that last March, my husband and I did a mission trip to Israel, Palestine, and while we were we were there for three weeks, and uh, we spent a full seven days in Bethlehem. And while there, a good friend of ours um, who works in Bethlehem uh, said to us, "There's a, a book you must read." And we'd read several books in preparation for going, uh, but we hadn't read this one. And she said that the book was Fail and Grace by Mark Braverman. So, of course, as soon as we got home, we ordered the book and read the book, and we understood why she said it was a must-read. And we hope that you'll listen with open ears and open minds, and that you'll take this message away and share it with a number of people. Without any further ado, Samir Ahmed. Sponsored the uh, sponsored us tonight. The Muslim uh, American Society of Tampa uh, Care, an organization dear to my heart. I've had a lot to do with care uh, in the Northeast. Uh, the Islamic community in Tampa. I'm glad to meet you. And also, we've had some help from um, Syrian Sunrise, uh, a wonderful new organization that has some information for you outside and is also asking for your support for a very urgent situation with your organization, and so please think about supporting them. <clears throat> it's always interesting to, uh, to think about how to get the feel of an audience before I begin, because there are so many directions to go. So many things to say about what is going on in Palestine today. And you know, I'm not always sure what to call it. We have this really cumbersome term, Israel-Palestine, Israel-Palestine, Israel-Palestine. I'm never quite sure, you know. Uh, there is definitely a Palestine. It's a geographic location. It is a people. It is an identity. It's a culture. But it is not a country. It is not a sovereign, viable, sustainable political entity today. So when people talk about Palestine, Israel, as if there is an Israel and there is a Palestine, I think that's not true. And it's a way to mask or deny or to gloss over the real situation. You know, people, you, as I go on, you will, you will get the sense that I'm not a uh, big believer in the, quote, two-state solution. I think it's a snare and a delusion. And anyone who's been there and studied the situation, I think, has to agree. And so people will often say to me, oh, well, of course, if you don't believe in the two states, you must be a one-stater. You believe in one state. And of course, depending on who's asking me about it, the implication must be, well, then what about the Jewish people and what about the state of Israel? If it's going to be one state, the Jews will no longer be a majority on the state of Israel. And of course, that's an unacceptable outcome. And what I've started to say to people is, you know, I'm not having that conversation anymore about one state or two states. I think it's a dead end conversation, and again, it it bypasses 
the real issue of implied bias is what we're really looking at today. There is no question about one state or two states now. We do have one state. It's called Israel. And it's a state that meets the internationally agreed upon definition of an apartheid state. And so our task, as Americans, as Jews, as Muslims, as Christians, as citizens of the world, is to delegitimize that situation. Now, mind you, I'm not saying do away with the state of Israel. I'm saying delegitimize the current policies of the state of Israel and save Israel from itself. The same way that the world, by the way, with the help of the global church, saved South Africa from apartheid. The blacks, who were oppressed, as well as the whites, who were the oppressors, who lived under that poisonous system. That's what we're up against today. How do you change what is in force now, and in fact is being built with our tax dollars as we sit here tonight, which is a part in the 21st century. And one of the worst and longest standing human rights violations in the world today. Now there is greater suffering in the world than Palestinian suffering. It's not just a question of scale, how many Palestinians are there, it's a tiny group compared to other nationalities, or other ethnicities, or other identified groups. And you can go to refugee camps in sub-Saharan Africa that make Dehesha outside of Bethlehem, or even the worst camps in Beirut, where Palestinians have been you know, imprisoned for over 60 years, that make those places look like country clubs. Palestinian suffering is not the worst suffering in the world. But it is one of the most important, perhaps the most important human rights situation in the world today, and one that as Americans in particular, we have a responsibility to address because we are complicit, we built it, and we keep it going. And when we address that, and when the myths and lies that are spread about what is really going on in Palestine and who the principles are and why it's going on and why it's happened, when those are deconstructed, especially for Americans, then perhaps the entire dominant American narrative can begin to be deconstructed. The narrative of Israel as an outpost of good Judeo-Christian democracy and goodness against this, these hordes of dark, violent, hateful people with a dark, violent religion bent on destroying our way of life. That's the dominant American narrative. And the Israel-Palestine story fits into that, fits it like a glove. So when Americans go and see what there is to be seen and see that it's not true, perhaps the rest of the House of Cards, the rest of that narrative, can start to be questioned as well. That's one reason why it's important. The other reason I think why it's important and why it's such an urgent human rights situation is that I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are, I'm sure there are people here who may be more expert in this particular piece of history and human rights knowledge than I. Does anyone else know about a refugee situation where close to a million people were displaced and there are four million of their descendants living today? Okay. Um, my age, I was born in 48, 64 years later, where there isn't even a question of repatriation or even compensation. They are refugees. They are stateless. Their home is gone. There's no question about their going home. Why? Because if they did, what happens to the Jewish state? It won't be Jewish anymore. And so, it's a non-starter. Can anyone else think of a situation where there isn't even an acknowledgement by the international community that these people have been made refugees and they deserve to go home, or at least to be given a decent place to live? I don't think so. So where do we get? 
For those of you who haven't been paying attention, or who have been paying attention, you will notice that politics is not working to resolve the situation. The peace process has not brought peace. And I think it's very clear why that's true. There are some basic assumptions upon which this so-called peace process is based that are, what was it, Mark Twain? I think it, it was. A, I spoke to an audience earlier today, and I, I checked it with them. And they, I've got it right. It was Mark Twain. He said, there are lies, and there are damn lies. So we have a couple of damn lies that are, not, that are operative here. The peace process is not working because it rests on at least two assumptions. One is that Israel is interested and willing to have a sovereign, contiguous, sustainable Palestinian state on its borders. Not true. I'll talk about a bit more about that. The other assumption is that the United States is an honest broker to the so-called negotiation process between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Absolutely not true. The United States, and I don't recall who said this, but I think it sums it up fairly clearly, and succinctly, the United States has been and continues to be Israel's lawyer and Israel's banker. We work for Israel. Supposedly in Israel's, in Israel's interests and in our interests, as is sometimes the case with legal cases and lawyer-client relationships, it's not always in the best interest of the client that you do with the client, says he wants. So it's against our national interest to be pursuing our policy with respect to Israel. And I believe it is an absolute disaster for Israel. Now, as far as Israel is concerned, Israel can't uh, agree to a two-state solution, to a partition of the territory. It was never in favor of that. It accepted the UN, it claims that it accepted the UN partition in 1947, but that was never seen as, a, as the end game. That was a transition to what Israel, as a Jewish state, has to do, which is to establish a sovereign majority or almost entirely Jewish state in the territory of historic Palestine. And the, problem, the problem for Israel has always been what to do with this inconvenient fact of there being non-Jews who lived there. Many of you may have heard the old uh, Zionist uh, motto or saying. That we're going back now to the end of the 19th century, which is, this is a land without people for a people without a land. So that was the myth. It was empty. Not only was it empty, but it was a barren wilderness. <coughs> and we came and we made the desert bloom. And we dried up the swamps, and we planted all those trees, and we've done all of this. So, of course, it's, in a, it's, it's complete mythology. Uh, you know, Palestine, if you go to the West Bank today, you can still see it, although Israel's doing its best to destroy, destroy the environment. But uh, if you go to Palestine today, you can see what would be the equivalent of the, the breadbasket of the Middle East. You know, the Galilee. Gorgeous hills, you know, planted with olive trees, and uh, you know it's very fertile and it's very productive. So uh, these are the myths. Israel is determined not to have this so-called peace because as long as there's no peace and as long as things are still quote in question and the West Bank is, quote, disputed territory. Um, it can continue to take land, establish de facto borders, uh, build cities uh, in violation of international law, create an infrastructure of roads that fragment the territory so there's no chance of a continuous state, uh, occupy the Jordan Valley for, quote, security purposes, and basically to do even better than what the South Africans did, or were trying to do uh, in the 80s and 90s when, that, when the Pretoria government was already on the ropes and said, okay, fine, I'll tell you what, we will give the, you know, 
We will have reforms. We will give the blacks uh, the freedom and their autonomy. They can have their own areas called Bantu stands. Uh, there will be something called separation, and uh, it'll all be fine. They will be self-enclosed enclaves. We will surround them. We will control everything, but, and, but they'll have their own government, and it will be fine. It, in effect, was a two-state solution. And Israel, I mean, it, it's done. When you go to the West Bank today, God says another story, you go to the West Bank today, you see that apartheid is done. It's built. It's in place. The finishing touches are being put on so once again, our task is not to debate uh, how to have a two-state solution. Our task is to understand and to plan how to do away with apartheid in our time. And it's American apartheid. I mean, that wall that Israel has built is our wall. It's our hegemonic racist frontier. <coughs> And it's an ugly, terrible thing. And by the way, it's not only ugly and terrible to the Palestinians who have been dispossessed and whose human rights have been stripped and are being taken away bit by bit every day, it's also a disaster for the Jews, refugees themselves, who settled Palestine as part of the Zionist movement, as part of the successive waves of immigration that started at the end of the 19th century and are you know, more or less continued. They live in a very troubled, very sick society. It's a totally militarized society. The kids are brought up to be racists. Uh, it's not a healthy place. Uh, there's something like 10,000 Israelis who hold farm, who hold second passports. People want to get out. Do you know what the fastest growing Jewish city in the world is? Mostly because of Israeli Jews who are emigrating there. Anybody want to take a guess? What's the fastest growing Jewish city in the world? No, no, it's already there. You're not going to What? Berlin. They love it there. It's great. It's a great city. It's where Israelis want to live. It's kind of ironic. It's not a healthy society. My people are the people who are living behind that wall. Ilan Pape, a wonderful Israeli historian who is now basically in exile. He could not carry on in Haifa. This is the UK. He wrote a book I commend it to you. It's called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He tells the story of 1947 through 1948. And he goes back to the plans that were made before that to do that ethnic cleansing when the opportunity presented itself with the conflict that inevitably were erupted in 47. He has a brilliant chapter at the end, and that chapter called Fortress Israel. He said, We have built a fortress. Now, there was a religious ethnic group that built fortresses with walls in the Holy Land about a thousand years ago, right? <laughs> how well did that work out, and how long did it last? A hundred years. It's the same story. It's very, very similar. There's another story that's very, very similar. When I'm speaking to most of Christian and church groups, I spend most of my time on it. I'll just refer to it here. It's the story of another empire that occupied Palestine and had to deal with an indigenous, non-violent movement of resistance led by a charismatic teacher who said, if you want to survive the attempt of the Roman Empire to destroy your civilization, and make you tax slaves, and make you good citizens of the empire, then follow God. And when I speak to Christian groups, I say, if you want to understand what Jesus Christ wants you to do, and understand the Gospels as the record of a movement of nonviolent social transformation against the evil of the empire, and we are looking at the same thing today. And of course, you know what empire we're talking about today. So politics are not going to work. The political situation as it lines up now, and it mostly has to do with Washington, is not going to bring about 
a resolution. I'm terrified of a two-state solution. You know, there's a Jewish group called J Street. It's a very clever name. Um, you know, there is no J Street in Washington. So this is, we're J Street. We are the other Jewish lobby. We are the anti-APAC. We love Israel, we're Zionists, but we think that APAC's policies of continuing unlimited, industrious attached military aid to Israel is bad, the occupation is terrible, it's ruining the chances of, for Israel to have any future, and so uh, we, uh, we're pushing for a two-state solution. This is why I'm not a fan of J Street, because I'm terrified of the two-state solution. The two-state solution, if it were to come about today, and there are people in Netanyahu's government who would like to see that happen, say, okay, fine, we'll take the borders. The borders are the current course of the wall. It grabs another 10% of the West Bank out of what was left. It takes the rest of, it takes the aquifers, it takes the settlements. It basically divides Palestine at least in half. And by the way, we'll get the Jordan Valley for security purposes. That would be the two-state solution. And then it would be done. Then you would have legitimized the fact that the ground today, which is apartheid. So you could call it a two-state solution, but it's apartheid, just like the South Africans wanted to call separation. You know, their one state solution. It was an apartheid. It was an apartheid state. Uh, that's not going to work. What is going to work and what is being built today, and which I'd like to tell you more about, is a global grassroots movement to delegitimize Israeli apartheid. And the two models that I use are one, the international grassroots movement to isolate and delegitimize the South African government, and the civil rights movement here in this country. Both were cases where grassroots movement, where the churches, by the way, played a powerful role in changing the political mood and in making it impossible for governments, world governments, and in the case of the civil rights movement, our own domestic government, to continue its policies, its racist policies. So the civil rights movement brought about an end to legalize racism in this country, to Jim Crow. And the anti-apartheid movement, uh, which gained enormous momentum in the 80s, and which was global, forced the South African government to, come, to go to the table and to end apartheid. Now, what happened to South Africa? Uh, in the aftermath of that, it's another story. It's not a pretty story. Uh, it has to do with global economic policies. And basically, the ANC gave away the store, even though they changed the political reality. But the fact is that that's what ended apartheid. And that was a good thing, because it was a horrible, ugly system. So how do we do that? Let me just spend a few minutes sort of giving you my, my, own, my own story, not because I'm a fascinating person, but because it's, uh, I think it explains and illustrates what we're looking at today and what is the major barrier against Americans in particular being able to take this line. You'll notice if you looked at the back table that the full title of my book is Fail and Grace, Christians, Jews, and the Search for Peace in the Holy Land. So often people ask, and I would certainly think that tonight's group people will ask, well, aren't you forgetting something? Uh, especially because when people think about the conflict, so-called conflict, it's not a conflict any more than the bombardment of Gaza was a war, but when they think about the situation, it's usually often popular opinion thinks about it as some sort of a religious conflict. You know, the Jews are fighting the Muslims, the Muslims hate the Jews, and the Christians are caught in the middle or something. It's not a religious conflict. <clears throat> What's going on over there has nothing to do with the relationships between these religious groups or the religions themselves. It's about human rights, it's about water, it's about land, it's about self-determination. Everybody knows that. It's been there. And another damn lie is that the Christians have almost completely exited the Holy Land. 
uh, because they've been driven out by the Muslims, the damn army. Christians and Muslims and Palestinians get along fine. Christians are leaving. Christians are leaving because of the occupation. They're leaving because they can.
enormous contribution to, you know, to civilization. But there is this psychology and sensibility to being Jewish, which when I first stood in front of that wall in 2006 that was bisecting Jerusalem and is 26 feet high, you've never seen a wall like this. People who've been to the Berlin Wall say that's nothing compared to this wall. When I stood in front of that wall, I said, ah, I understand this wall. I understand this obscenity. This lives inside me because I was brought up with that wall inside me. That world out there is dangerous. They will kill you or convert you. It wasn't ever quite clear to me what was worse. <laughs> so stay within your tribe and when you call yourself a tribe. You know, deal with the outside world. But it was always the outside world. For me, it was always the non-Jewish world. Now, I, you know, I grew up in the middle of the 20th century in a liberal, progressive environment. I was never personally subjected to anti-Semitism, to my knowledge. And yet, I absorbed, as if in my DNA, the, the, the experience of 2,000 years of Europe, straight from my grandparents. The Goyim are dangerous. And also, by the way, they're mostly a drunken ignorant realm. <laughs> so there's a sense of superiority and specialness in that as well. Uh, the beautiful thing that's happened for me is that I brought that wall down. And it was Palestine that did it. When I finally went to Palestine, and I had lived in Israel in the past, when I finally went to Palestine, you know, in the middle, the middle age. So I met the Palestinians. Right? Now, mind you, when I grew up, there were two enemies. I mean, there was the world. Basically, the world was in front of but there were two particular groups that were singled out, that were mine, sworn enemies. The German people, because of what they did to us, and the Arabs, because of what they would do to us if we would allow it to happen. So that's the next Holocaust going to come to play. Now, of course, we have Iran. I'm sure that Bibi Netanyahu every day Thanks God, well, he doesn't pray to God, but thanks to somebody for Ahmed Ahmadinejad. You know, what a political gift for him. That and the toy rockets that are, quote, raining down from Gaza. What a political gift for him. So, anyway, I meet the Palestinians. And when I, when I first started, you know, hanging around the West Bank and meet Palestinian people, young people, older people, I would start off with, you know, full disclosure, you know, on I'm, I'm a Jew, I, I need to let you know I come from over there, I'm one of those. And, you know, people I talk to look at me and say, I mean, this is not news to me, we know you're Jewish, why are you telling me this? What are you here? Let's talk. They didn't hate me, they didn't fear me, they were angry, they were bitter, frustrated. But it was, Ahana Sahana, thank you for coming. This was my enemy. Not so in Israel. With my cousins and my family and many of my friends. And my grandfather was born there. He was one of six. He emigrated in, in, in around the year 1900. It was an arranged marriage. It was his ticket out of the park. He came here on a second generation American. But I have a huge, vast extended family in Israel. I talked to Israelis. I said, well, I'm going to Ramallah. I'm going to Bethlehem. They'd say, I snow it. Are you crazy? They're animals. They'll kill you. Don't you understand this? And then things I don't want to repeat about the ugly, racist things that come out of otherwise intelligent, presumably nice people in Israel about what they believe about the Palestinians. So I mourn for them. You know, again, it's the Palestinians who are getting dispossessed and ripped off, but I am much more concerned about the psychological and spiritual health of my family and my people in Israel. They am about the Palestinians, who know what's up, who, like most Middle Eastern Arabs, are used to being colonized and are used to being screwed by the West. They know they are. Patience, smooth, we'll get there. 
Israelis have no clue who they are. Their personalities and their identity is based on fear and hatred and paranoia. You know, I, 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 I call myself, a, in my former life, before this happened to me, I was a clinical psychologist. I call myself a recovering psychologist. <laughs> my specialty was post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very good. I worked with groups that have been traumatized. Thank you. Now, the injury, the psychological injury of either acute or cumulative trauma, a threat to the safety of yourself or someone close to you, is not so much the classic symptoms of flashbacks and numbness and all that stuff that we know about. The real injury is the loss of the ability to trust and to form relationships. That's what is at risk if you have been seriously hurt by a fellow, by another human being. We know this about rape victims, we know this about combat victims, we know this about children who have been victims of abuse. And the healing has to be around that. And I know that the treatment of choice for individuals and groups that have been traumatized, hurt by other human beings, politically, individually, by crime, whatever, is not to take that group and those people, seal them up inside a house, build a high fortress wall around that house, post soldiers along that wall, and tell the people inside, it's not safe out there, trust no one, we will protect you. This is not how you recover from 2,000 years of persecution, and certainly not how you recover from something as inexpressibly horrible as the attempt to wipe out all the Jews of Europe over a period of five years in the middle of the 20th century. So that doesn't work. Israel doesn't work. The idea of a Jewish state doesn't work. Political Zionism may have seemed like a good idea at the end of the 19th century in Tsarist Russia, where it appeared that the emancipation of the Jews was not working, that the Jews were worse off than they'd ever been. It was getting worse. And what was the Zeitgeist? The Zeitgeist was nationalism, ethnic nationalism, in fact. You know, it was for the Italians, and Germany for the Germans, and France for the French, and what have you. Ethnic nationalism. So, great, we'll take one of those. We'll have that. Stay for the Jews. We need it. We need to protect ourselves. It's not a solution today. It's a tragic anachronism today, and it's not the trajectory of history. The trajectory of civilization today is away from nationalism, and certainly away from ethnic nationalism, a country based on ethnicity. Why is it that the Jews get to have that? What makes us so special? Well, it's Western guilt, it's Christian guilt, and all kinds of other geopolitical things. I mean, one reason that the United States is Israel's banker and Israel's lawyer is that you know in the United States, you know, when was the last time the United States had a foreign policy that made sense that was really good for America? Anybody name one of those? I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's an outlier somewhere. But we think that in order to, in this case, now keep Iran's oil and to win you know, the post-war geopolitical globalization battle, we need to have Israel where it is. And we need, and that, and that locks in with Israel's domestic agenda, which is fear. There's a bad guy out there. They want to kill us. You know, so that all locks in. But of course, it doesn't work. I think that if Israel, and by that I mean the, the culture, the civilization that was created by successive waves of Jewish immigration throughout the 20th century, and that built a very impressive society. Culturally, intellectually, technologically, culturally, uh, 
That's what I mean by Israel. I mean the people who live there. I mean the citizens. If there is to be a future for those people, Israel has to look very, very different than it does today. And the ideology that motivated and drove, and the political, geopolitical realities that drove the creation of that entity has to change. And eventually we are looking at some kind of multi-ethnic, multinational state. Maybe it's federated, maybe you'll have Jewish and you know, Palestinian uh, subdivisions or something like that, maybe in a transitional way. But it certainly can't look like it looks today, which is that Israel, Israel is in charge and it's all about, quote, Israeli, meaning Jewish security against these Palestinians who somehow have the ability to destroy Israel, which is a joke. You know, when, when Newt Gingrich says there are, no, there, there are no Palestinians, of course, you know what he's up to. And how much blue sky there is between him and Barack Obama with respect to the actual policies that Obama pursues, I don't think there's a lot of blue sky, by the way. Um, but he's right. There are no Palestinians in the sense that there is no Palestinian state which has the ability to present any threat to Israel. There's no Palestinian entity. There is, similar to what existed in Jesus' time with the Jewish client government that was installed in Jerusalem with the Jewish king who worked for Rome, there is a client state. There's the Palestinian Authority. We created it. The Oslo Accords in 1993 were a blueprint for apartheid. And Abu Mazen may be a good guy, but he works for us. He doesn't work for his people. He would like to work for his people, but he doesn't work for his people. He can't structurally and politically. It's impossible. The Palestinian Authority is the largest employer in Palestine. It's all Western money. We own the place. So there is no Palestine. And as long as that's true, there will continue to be resistance. The Palestinians are not going to put up with it. And it's wrong. It's just wrong and unacceptable. So, you know, South Africa, before the riots started in the 60s, was a peaceful place after 22 years of apartheid. There may be a Pax Romana that can be established in Palestine. It's peace. But it's not justice, and it's wrong, and it's not sustainable. So that's what we are. That's what we are up against. Let me say one or two things about um, the situation here, especially with respect to what I do most of the time, which is to work with American Christians and churches. And I freely confess that I have not had a lot to do institutionally with the Muslim community either on a secular or a religious basis. I know Judaism real well. I know Christianity real well. I'm not well versed in Islam. And I don't think I can make many intelligent statements about how American Muslims or global Muslims fit in to this analysis and this picture that I'm going to present to you. And so I think that would be a terrific discussion to have. I do think that clearly from what I can make out, American Muslims have very different interests and very different agendas in terms of your well-being and your survival as a group than American Jews and American Christians. I mean, of course, 9-11 America, it has to be true. So, and there's more for me to learn about that. But I would submit, and maybe you could challenge the statement, that politically, where the money is, I mean that literally, but it may be true as well, Politically, where I think the answer lies is with the American church. Demographically, culturally, this is a Christian country. The churches are vast, deep, wide, well organized. They're growing. You know, the topography of that is changing from the mainstream Protestant denominations over to the evangelical freestanding churches. But Christianity is growing in this country. And this is probably the most religious country on earth, except for maybe. Pakistan and Indonesia. So the church is an enormous resource. What I discovered when I came home, so in 2006, I see the occupation, blows me away. I come home, not to put too fine a point to it, 
the doors of the synagogue did not, the synagogue did not exactly fling open to receive my message about what the trouble the Jews were. But the churches did. And I spent all my time speaking to churches. Christians are hungry for this message. Why? Because I found out, and I did not know much about Christianity growing up, I wasn't supposed to even step into a church. But I found out about Christians were those that I believe, and most Christians will agree, who deserve the name as follower of Jesus. It's not about going to church on Sunday, hearing an empty sermon, and going home, going on with whatever you're doing in your life. It's about bringing the kingdom. It's about Matthew 25. It's about social justice. It's about being out there in the world, bringing the good news, which is that we are all responsible for one another, and it's our responsibility to take care of the dispossessed, the widow, the orphan, the poor. That's what being a Christian is, and a follower of Jesus is all about. And so Christians heard me in Jews speaking about the Palestinians, and they said, well, of course we know what to do about the Palestinians. Same thing we do with our domestic issues, or anywhere in the world where there's injustice and racism. Except we can't. We're Christians. We bear enormous responsibility and burden of guilt for what we did to the Jews for 2,000 years. We can't touch us. Who are we? to say to the Jews, you cannot have this state after what we did to them. Except that that's exactly wrong. What I say to Christians, and I've become a broken record about this, is Christian-Jewish reconciliation in the aftermath of World War II in getting rid of the toxic anti-Jewishness in Christianity and purging yourselves of that in building bridges of trust with the Jewish people and on your knees saying, I'm sorry, that's very good. It should continue. Vigilance against anti-Semitism, and it's real, and it's not gone, is really important. But that's not what this is about, and most Christians can use that. This is about a human rights issue, pure and simple. The irony and the tragedy of it is that if you are a non-Jew in this country, or in Europe for that, and you start talking trash about Israel, which is how it's perceived. And you start talking about, you say the P word, you start talking about Palestinian human rights. You're accused of being anti Semitic. Judaism is Zionism. The state of Israel and the whole organized Jewish and Israeli lobby made sure that nobody would fail, nobody would make a distinction between them ever again. Israel. The state of Israel and the Jewish people, the same thing. Don't make the mistake of thinking they're any different. Now, that's not true. But that's the official diplomatic, diplomatic policy of the state of Israel. We have that on record. So, you can't do it. But Christians were hungry to hear from a Jew. It's not about that. It's not about loving the Jewish people. It's about loving justice. And in this case, you've got to confront the Jewish people and say, you're doing wrong. Okay. Palestinians have gotten an ordeal. It has to stop. And you will be called names. And some of those precious relationships will be disrupted, maybe destroyed. And for clergy, that's particularly an issue. This, this is a precious thing in Jewish Christian reconciliation. And the tragedy of it is, and in Christian terms, the cross that has to be picked up is, yeah, you do the right thing. You take this on, uh, this cost. But it's not your problem. We just have our own troubles. We have to figure out how to get out of this mess and throw ourselves into it, how to heal ourselves properly, and how to undo the damage of this tragic long term we've taken with our ethnic nationalist homeland project. I don't know how we're going to do that, frankly. But the rest of the world has to be liberated from enabling the Jews to do this. And so what I say to Christians, and I don't know, what the, frankly, what the message to Muslims can be, but what I say to Americans on a secular basis in general is, it's not about loving the Jewish people. It's about loving, if you're religious, God. It's about loving justice and being true to your principles of justice. But if you want to make it about loving the Jewish people, fine. Then love us the way you love your alcoholic uncle 
Who's asking for another bubble in the case of the car? It's tough love, it's hard love, but that's the only way to love us. So that's sort of my thing. This is what I do. And I have made common cause with lots and lots of Christians working within denominations and working within uh, grassroots uh, interfaith and interdenominational uh, uh, committees and task forces within cities to help them with that. And what I find myself saying over and over again is, you know, I really pray for the day that you don't need a Jew's permission to be a faithful Christian or a decent human being. But until that time, you know, I accept the assignment, but I really pray for the day when you don't need me to do that anymore. It's not about me. It's about getting your own house in order. Now, I've gone over the time. Let me just say what I think needs to happen. What is this global grassroots movement? Okay? It involves education. We have to deconstruct what it is that we have been taught as a society about what's going on over there and about it too. And that's a tall order, but you have to begin. And it's not hard to do. All you need to do is bring people over. Bring over Israelis who are in the peace movement over there. who are desperately trying to save their country from itself. Bring over Palestinians. Let them meet Palestinians. Sell olive oil on Christmas is another face of Palestine. And when you take pilgrimages, see what there is to be seen. Don't take the Dead Stones tour. Don't get the sanitized Israeli propaganda tour. Go see what's really going on. It doesn't take much. Spend three hours with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions in Jerusalem. You'll understand the occupation. You'll see what's going on. It doesn't take much. So there are lots of opportunities for Jews. There's a really, there's dozens of good DVDs out there. Just throw it in the computer, put it on a screen. It shows you what's going on. People say, wow, this is not what I'm getting from the New York Times. <laughs> and then where we're going is BDS. It's a mantra. BDS is short for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Go to the net, go to bdsmovement.net. It will tell you everything you need to know. It is a call uh, from Palestinian civil society in Palestine and across the world to, ex to exercise economic, cultural, and um, academic pressure on Israel. It's a big tent. You can get in lots of different ways. You can poke your nose in and say, under the tent and say, well, I'm not going to buy products made in the illegal settlements in the West Bank. You know, Ahaba, Kathmandu. Go to the store and say, I'm not buying this. Why? Or you can uh, boycott Caterpillar Corporation that makes the bulldozers to destroy Palestinian homes. And the uh, Motorola that's making lots of different kinds of uh, intelligence and technical, technical equipment for the IDF. Or HP, I'm not sure what HP is doing, but that's also been identified as one of the campaigns. TIA Craft, which is a huge, huge mutual fund that invests for teachers, is another one. There are, there are campaigns going on, targeted campaigns. And the point of these is not to bring these companies to their knees, that will never happen. Or not to bring Israel to its knees if you refuse to buy hummus made in Israel that's on the shelves in, in, in uh, Trader Joe's. It educates people. And it starts to change the political wind. It's non-violent direct action. And it will make a difference. Organize campus groups. Campus groups for BDS. Work within, if you're Christian, work within denom your denominations to support the divestment initiatives to get your money, your pension, your pension fund money, out of those uh, investments. There are huge fights going on outside the United Methodist Church and the Presbyterian Church USA. Huge fights, internal church struggles, and it's awesome. Because people are learning about it. Well, why do we want to work out Caterpillar? Well, we could never do that. What would we say to our Jewish friends? Like the conversation's going on, and people are learning. So that's what we have. We also now have, and I 
believe there's information about it uh, on that back table, something called Kairos USA. And really, I don't have time to talk more about it. But Kairos, in 1985, the South African churches wrote a pathetic, powerful document they called Kairos. And it's a Christian term. It means God's time, a time of opportunity when you are required to take a stand because of what you have witnessed. It's the opposite of the Kronos, which is linear time. It's God's time. The appearance of Jesus in Christian thought it was a Kairos moment. It was, a Kairos, it was a Kairos moment in South Africa where the churches said, we can no longer support our government. It's a tyranny. We are not with Christ until we stop this. And that was a huge blow to the government because the church had been collaborating down the line for 100 years with, with official racism in that country. So now the American Christians are writing a Kairos document. It's a confessional document in saying we can no longer support our government's policy. We are no, we are not with Christ unless we take a stand against this. Um, the other example, again, and I'll just close with this, is if you want to know what needs to happen, if you want a manifesto and a blueprint about what needs to happen, read the letter. What they were proposing was reform. We're progressive. We're liberal. Just what the South African government was proposing. Reform. We'll take care of our blacks. It's just what the progressive Jews and some progressive Jew uh, Christians are proposing now about Israel. You know, and what our government is saying. Two-state solution. We'll get a deal for the Palestinians, but we have to work with and, you know, to both sides and listen to both narratives and it's got to be fair and balanced and all of this. Totally denying the reality, which is you've got one people that's foot on other people's neck. And King said that. He said, no, freedom is never given voluntarily by the oppressor to the oppressed. You have to take it and you have to do it non-violently, but you have to take it and you have to not stop until you have it. And this is what the early Christians did. And this is what we are called to do. It's not about reform. It's about standing up for justice. It's not about negotiation. It's about what's right and about what's fair. Ultimately, if we have a future in this world, and we don't destroy the environment first, and the two things are related, you know, political injustice and environmental destruction are totally related. If we are to have a future on this planet, this is what will prevail. And if you want a cause that for Americans in particular crystallizes this, and that the same rattling and the stuff about Iran, you see the New York Times yesterday, right? Iran versus Israel. They're getting ready. We've seen this before, not that long ago, right? Getting ready for war. Changing the intelligence reports to say that they've got a bomb. It's the same thing. If you want to know the real story about Iran, Go to RaymondMcGovern.com. This is a guy who used to be a CIA analyst, and now he's writing the truth. This is a guy from inside the intelligence community. If you want to know what's really going on with Iran, read RaymondMcGovern.com. RaymondMcGovern.com. If we're going to have a future, this is a this is a issue that crystallizes it, and that can burst the myths and that can start <clears throat> to mobilize Americans. I see it right now as the American church. How Jews, Muslims, and people who are not affiliated or identified with a religious tradition are going to be part of that, I don't know. But the spearhead has to be the dominant American culture, which is the churches. And the beautiful thing about Kairos USA is it's not just the white Protestant denomination. African American churches are involved now. They're jumping in with both feet. What they say to me when I come to them about this is, "Where have you guys been?" Of course, we understand this. We will take this on. And the evangelicals who've been out there in the world have met the Muslims, and it challenges their theology. But they know what's right, and they're ready to work for Palestine. And they are not Christian Zionists. All of this can come together, and this is an opportunity. So, thank you for that.
I'll stay up here. And, uh, Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, we are we're going to have a session for question and answer. We'll give it maybe 15 minutes. Well, thank you for an uh, informative lecture. How do uh, you know Jews and Christians, or particularly the Christians, uh, resolve the dilemma or, or the paradox about the salvation, which you know, according to the, to the Christian belief, has. You have to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and as the Savior and that He died and all that. And the fact that Jews don't. Yet, they are the favored people. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not going to go to hell even though they don't believe in Jesus. Well, I mean, you raise an important point which is there's a lot of theological work that has to be done about this to clear the way for those Christians and Jews alike who are kind of stuck with some of those theological categories. Um, you know, the Christology and the issue of whether Jesus is divine and all of that, I think is not terribly important. Um, people are entitled to have their own theology with respect to how they understand and conceive of God. My own view is that if we have 100 people in this room, they can all, and I say, who believes in God? And everybody raises their hand except the the, the stubborn atheists in the room, right? But of all those people who raise their hands, I would say that there are that there are that many ideas and thoughts about what God really is. I think by definition, we cannot, as human beings, define God. So there is a Christology, there is a set of, of Christian beliefs, that's fine and good. The real issue has to do with people. The real issue has to do with whether God really loves one people more than another and promises them certain things and gives them special rights. Now, I would challenge, and I think there are Christians and Muslims and Jews who believe that about their own beliefs. <clears throat> and I think they're all wrong. I think they need to examine that because that is not what those religions are about. And if there is God, that's not what God does. By definition, if we're monotheists and we believe in one God, you can't, God does not play favorites, and he does not make covenants that have real estate clauses in them. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just one more word about Christianity, about Judaism and Christianity. Uh, I am not a card carrying Christian. Yeah? I'm a Jew. I was raised a Jew. I'll always be a Jew, whatever that is. <clears throat> but I am definitely a follower of Jesus. Because I believe that Jesus was the best Jew. And I believe that Jesus was in the, in the prophetic tradition, was taking Judaism where it was supposed to go, which was, and was where the prophets were headed, but didn't quite get there, which is God does not live in a house, God does not live on a mountain, God does not give territory to us, and uh, He loves all of us equally, or she loves all of us equally, and we have to leave this tribal. Uh, exceptionalist um, framework and make this universal. That's what Jesus was doing as a Jew, confronting the Jewish institution of his day, which had, had, you know, had thrown him with Rome. And you saw what happened to him, right? And the Jews at the time said, thank you very much, get him out of here, we'll stay with the deal we've got, this works for us. And the followers of Jesus, Jews, went off, and it ended up becoming a whole new religion or religious faith, which then ran into its own problem within 300 years of thrown in with Rome. Same problem, exclusivism, exceptionalism. That's the issue. Is it particular or is it universal? And that's the theology that we have to confront, not whether, whether Jesus was God and whether you need to be believe in Jesus to go to heaven. Absolutely, Jesus didn't say that. That's a misinterpretation of the Gospels. Got one over here. Uh, as we all know, uh, Palestinians they have Muslims and Christians, uh, people that are, you know belong to the same country, basically or ethnicity. And with the, um, how can I 
let's say the uh, uh, kind of uh, the, uh, the Christianity here and Judaism basically working together. How the how do the uh, Palestinian Christians fit in the mix since they they don't get any treatment or, or better treatment than Arab or Muslim Palestinians, even though with the help of the American Christians or over the world. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me just address what, what I think I know and what I believe about the issue of Palestinian Christians. In 1948, the uh, basic breakdown of Palestinians living in Palestine was about 20% Christian, or 80% Muslim, and 20% Christian or non-Muslim, other small groups. The Christian population of Palestine is now somewhere between 1% and 2%. Christians are leaving because they can. Um, it's not been about Christians, Christianity and Islam in Palestine. It's about human rights. And every Palestinian that I talk to say, yeah, maybe there's some cultural conflicts sometimes, but that's not what the situation is about in Palestine. Christians and Muslims get along, get along just fine. Again, I don't think it's about Christianity or Islam. The, the, the issue of Christianity, however, does play very powerfully now in the political situation. And I'm wondering when and how that can be true for Islam as well with respect to uh, Muslim leaders in Palestine and the Muslim community in the rest of the world. I don't see it. And I wonder if anybody can say anything about that. The Palestinian Christians are doing some very important things. Go to the web and Google Palestine Kairos. And you will see that there is a, a very powerful, effective movement, and it's a pitifully small minority, that have written a prophetic document, and it is being used across the world, in churches, to educate people about Palestine. It's called a moment of truth, a cry of pain and hope from Palestine. And it's a powerful document. And it's going to make a difference politically. When and how and if, is my question, Islam can play a role there. I don't think it does. It may be that Islam is not ready. You know, it's, from what I understand, you have a real struggle in being able to bring you know, Islam you know, into, into real conversation with modernity. And so you have a different struggle right now, but I think it's something to think about. My name is Mary Shahada, and I'm a widow as of 2007, uh, having been married for 43 years to a Palestinian Muslim who became American. We raised two sons. Um, his mother and father were, I think you say, Falah, uh proud. <laughs> proud uh, uh, farmers, and uh, they did not read or write Arabic. Um, of the ten children, the least educated has a, ma uh, a master's degree in education. My husband had uh, was head of electrical engineering at University of Minnesota. My point being, in the many times that we were able to visit uh, his parents in uh, Tulkrem, the, the Nava, next to Tulkrem, near um, uh, Nablus, um, in the many times that we were there and spent time with his parents, uh, his mother would tell me about uh, when, when they were not planting the fields or harvesting, they would go to Jaffa and uh, to a home there where on one side was a Christian woman family and on the other side was a Jewish family and one babysat, one did mending and, and so forth. Can we have that again? Jaffa is a wonderful example of that. By the way, Shahada, are you related you know, to, uh, to oh, Raja? The Tawal. Yeah, there are five families in Palestine. Right? Everybody's related to everybody. Else. My, my, my you know, Raja is, is actually Christian, but he's, oh, he's, he's Christian. part of our, our, our family, uh, circle of friends. Yes. My son, Ramzi, and Sami. Okay. Nice to meet you. Jaffa is a wonderful example. Haifa was another one. Can we have that again? Inshallah. I mean, I think that's the only foreseeable Look, 
the Palestinians and the Jews. Two marvelous, marvelous people. I mean, what could be, what could have been, and what could be if we could live together and create a society together? I joke sometimes, I say we could rule the world. I mean, two talented, wonderful people. I mean, just look at your family. And 43 years of marriage, I worked every day, I'm an academic, but I worked every day for peace, and I have to tell you that I'm retired now, and I said I was never going to do any of this again because after 43 years, what did, what did it get me? wonderful Jewish friends, but not a damn thing has changed over there, or politically. Right. I mean, everybody is a victim over there because of the politics. What? Okay, Salaam Alaikum, and good evening. Mark, thank you for all the work that you're doing and speaking out. And I have just two quick questions. One is regarding J Street, because I guess I, somehow I feel confused about J Street. Because when I read their emails and some of their information, you know, they seem so moderate that you think, you know, this is really good. But then from the Jewish community, I've heard people say it's just APAC life. So I'd like to get a little bit more information from you. And then, real quickly, again, referring to some Jewish friends, they said to me, you have an image problem that pretty much Jewish Americans think of Muslims or Palestinians specifically as terrorists. And we have to help clean that image. So I do have a group of friends that are really directing me, telling me that you know, we want to work on peace, but that's the first step, is to change the image of the Palestinians in this country. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, in some sense, it's, it's easy. It's not, it shouldn't be hard. I mean, Palestinians need to be visible. Um, you need to, uh, to reach out and probably say, you know, here we are, we're Palestinians, and we are not, and we are not terrorists. And the more people can meet you, the better. So any way that that can happen, and I don't have any particular ideas about that, but it's happening, it's happening more and more. Uh, uh, I'll just digress for a second and then get back to, to the issue of J Street. I think that and here we are in, in, in an academic environment. This is one place where that can and should happen. If you have Palestinian groups or Muslim groups or Arab American groups here in this country or in the campuses, don't just hang out with yourselves. You know, find ways to interact actively with the larger community here. You know, with the white community, with the African American community, with the foreign students, with everybody. They need to know you. That's all it takes. So work for that. And think about what can happen actually academically I'm talking about the academy. What is happening in classrooms? What is being taught? What is allowed to be taught? And I will tell you that in the academy in this country, there are red lines. Nobody talks about it, but there are red lines about what you can teach and what you can write. And there are unwritten rules. And one of the rules is you can make noises and talk about Palestinian suffering, but you may not challenge basic fundamental Zionist assumptions about what that might mean in terms of the state of Israel and the viability and reasonableness of Zionism. That's A and B. You can say anything you want, and you can, and you can write anything you want, but you may not challenge Jewish sensibilities as defined by some Jews. If it's going to offend Jews, if it's going to make Jews uncomfortable, if it's going to make Jews threatened, or God forbid it's going to subject you to the charge of anti-Semitism, and you can be sure that it will, either mildly or right out there, then people stay back. So, your professors, your deans, your official university policies, get ready to challenge them. That is an important frontier, because we're talking about grassroots, and if it's not reflected in the academy, in the colleges, in the, in, in the departments of religion, and comparative religion, and political science, and conflict resolution, and peace studies, <laughs> and in the seminaries, it's not going to be fully permeating the society. So you have an opportunity here. As far as JCU is concerned, yeah, you're right, they're moderates. And I'll remind you, again, I'll send you back to the Birmingham Letter Jail where Martin Luther King famously said, and I'm paraphrasing, our real enemy is not the Ku Klux Klan, it's the white moderate. <laughs> J Street scares the hell out of me because it's a place for Jews to go and still feel good about being Zionists. And they desperately want that, and I understand that, but I'm sorry, you can't have it. And most people who don't know a lot 
say, ah, J Street, right, the Jews are on board here, that's great, they're working for the Palestinians. Wrong. J Street is a Zionist organization. It, it's tactically, they're very smart and they're very good. They're opening the tank wide open. But the core, the core is we have to preserve Israel as a Jewish state, whatever it takes. That's not going to work. That's going to slow things down. That's a barrier. Um, basically, I was wondering what are some of the things that you saw when you went in 2006 and the occupation that triggered you to speak at? Oh gosh. <laughs> you know, how about two different kinds of license plates? One for Jews and one for Palestinians. Two sets of roads. How about the dead eyes of my Jewish cousins at those checkpoints, treating other human beings like animals? How about hundreds of tired men and women with their kids trying to get to hospitals lining up at 4 o'clock in the morning in the dark to go through checkpoints through cattle pens that were built for them every day and bored, sometimes sadistic, uh, young Jewish men and women opening the gate, closing the gate, just playing with them, making it difficult. Nothing to do with security, just to make their life impossible. How about that? And much, much, much more. How about 10,000 people in prison without sentences? Several thousands of them being children. How about pregnant women dying at checkpoints because they can't get through? I mean, the list goes on and on and on. How about Gaza? Which is the largest prison on earth where people are on starvation diets, women not being bombarded with illegal weapons. How about that? I mean, the list goes on. Can you see it? It changes you. Assalamu alaikum. I wanted to ask you about some of the evangelical churches. Have you spoken uh, to them and what welcome did you get? Oh, yes. The evangelical churches. I, I love these people because um, they, get, they get that being a Christian has nothing to do with belonging to a denomination or a church institution. They get that it's about having a, you know, a personal relationship with your own faith and with building strong communities. Mainline Christians do that in spite of their denomination. Because a, a denomination is a huge machine and a huge institution, and it is primarily concerned with preserving itself. And being true to the Gospels and being true to the religious principles, frankly, is secondary, because the institution has to preserve itself. So what's nice about the, the evangelicals is they don't have to fight that fight. If they have a pastor that uh, decides that it's important for them to do water projects in Sudan, or to build schools in Palestine, or hospitals in Vietnam, they just go and do it. That's what's great about this. So, to the extent that the evangelicals are turning to Palestine, and many of them are because they've been there, you know, on, 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 on mission, uh, that represents a, a very—it's very, very important politically because that's a huge influx of energy for the church uh, in general. The other interesting thing about what's happening with evangelicals is what they're doing in, uh, in, in terms of uh, their relationship with Muslims. Because here's how it works. If you're evangelical, in the classic sense of the word, you're supposed to go out there and convert people to Christianity because you love them and you want to be in heaven with them. And they, they won't be in heaven unless you can bring them to, to Jesus. I have to bring you to Jesus. Okay? 
So what happens to these people? They go out there. And because they're evangelical, because they're out there in the world, which is in the non-Christian world, they're meeting Muslims, and they're meeting Buddhists, etc. And they're saying, I know I've been taught that this person is damned, but it just doesn't seem that way to me. And I know I've been taught that this person doesn't believe in God, but I think, I think she does. And so what do I do about that? challenges their theology, and they're scratching their heads about it, and they're trying to figure it out. I mean, I, I spoke to a group of evangelical Christians, and their, the biggest question for them was, do Muslims believe in God? Because <laughs> right? they don't know that Allah is God. They think it's some other God. Right? Most like, Christians, especially evangelical Christians. So I say, you know, and they wanted me to expound on it. My answer to the question was, yes. <laughs> Muslims believe in God. Say God, obviously. So there's a lot of progress happening, happening there. I t- I'll tell you a quick story. There's a guy named Bob Roberts. This guy, he says, here I am, I'm Bob Roberts. You know, I stand, I, I've got the plexiglass lectern, you know, the whole, all of the contraptions that evangelical uh, creatures tend to have. I said, he said, I'm Bob Roberts, I'm from West Texas, I'm a Baptist preacher, I'm the real thing. I am not apologetic about that. I find myself on mission in Afghanistan. I've got my Bibles. I'm in Afghanistan. And somebody says to me, somebody comes up to me and says, I would like to show you the real Afghanistan. Will you come with me? And Bob says, okay. At which point, they get on mules and they go up into the mountains and he has no idea where he is. And he realizes that the guy who wants to show him the real Afghanistan is like the number two guy in the Taliban. And he's sitting in a house up in the mountains in a circle of people with the beards, you know, and the turbans and everything. And uh, they say, we like you, Bob. We trust you. Because Bob says, you know, I'm here with my Bibles, but I'm not going to convert you. I just want to help you. I'm going to build schools. They said, fine. We'd like you to build us schools. At which point he said, will you excuse me for a moment? And he goes, well, this is the way he tells the story. So will you excuse me for a moment? He says, I went off and I prayed. I said, dear Jesus, these people want me to build schools for them. Do you know what they're going to teach in those schools? Do you know what kind of schools we're talking about? Right? Do you know the book they're going to open in that school and teach their children? He said, Jesus, I want you to strike me dead right now if I shouldn't do this because I'm going to do this. <laughs> now, is that true or not? And you get to the point that he's made it, and he says to people, he says, you know what? I don't know where I'm going with this, but this is where I'm supposed to go. That's